In March this year, when the novel coronavirus was rampaging around Western Europe and parts of the US, the common thinking was that most people would brush it off in a week or two, and if you were really unlucky, you might end up in the ITU. No one really thought that seven months down the line, hundreds of thousands of people would still be sick. But here we are. The big questions for those of us still suffering are, when are we going to get better? How many people have? Is recovery even possible? Well, I've just done a huge study of 1,600 long haulers to try and find out. Let's go through it. When I first started making these films in April, there was practically no recognition of long COVID whatsoever. It didn't even have its name at that point. But now it seems there's a new article out every day. It's a huge, huge issue affecting what recent data suggests might be 24% of all cases. This is a brand new preprint looking at mostly mild cases where 97% weren't hospitalised. It's not just a condition that affects those who get seriously ill, although the numbers in that cohort of seriously ill were larger, 40.6% not recovered after 90 days. We're also now starting to see some research that backs up what I've been saying for months, that is that it's not a homogenous condition. Our strongest take home message at this stage is that there are a number of different patterns. And if your pattern isn't the same as what you've read in the paper or what somebody you met had, it doesn't mean it's not real. Other people are having the same experience as you. Dr. Elaine Maxwell of the National Institute for Health Research. There are a wide range of recurring symptoms which variously affect the respiratory system, the brain, cardiovascular system and heart, the kidneys, the gut, the liver and even skin. They can range in intensity and duration and do not necessarily present themselves in a uniform manner. Four kinds of long COVID are quoted here, which vaguely tally up with my proposed pathologies discussed in a previous film. At least the complexity of the condition, or potentially conditions, are being properly recognised now. But what about recovery? People are still sick after seven months. When are they going to get better? Doctors have blithely been quoted as saying, you will recover, but this is a new condition. No one's ever seen it before. The only other condition that it bears the most resemblance to is ME and CFS, and that's not exactly a condition renowned for its recovery rate. So I decided to reach out and do a study. Assuming that recovery is possible, then we ought to be somewhere on this Bell distribution curve, and we need a data set to try and find out where. I collected data from several long haul support groups on Facebook and the Body Politic group on Slack. Now, the usual caveats to this data apply. The sample is both self-selecting and self-reporting. Uh, the manner of those platforms mean that either ends of the age spectrum are probably slightly underrepresented. But the biggest issue with this particular study is that those who have recovered are perhaps less likely to still be frequenting those groups. All I could really do here was ask respondents who knew people who had recovered to uh, forward them this survey and get them to be involved because we needed them to contribute to get a fuller picture. I started off by asking when people first contracted COVID. Overwhelmingly, this was the middle of March, pre-lockdown, meaning that the vast majority of long haulers have now been sick for seven months. 1,013 of the 1,600 became sick in March. 275 in April. How severe has it been? Well, one way of trying to ascertain this is to establish how many people have felt fit enough to go back to their previous level of work. So, after seven months, what proportion of people are now back in work full-time with no ill effects? The answer is just 6%. The largest slice of this pie is those who can't work at all, 28.4%. Then 20.8% who say they can work at a much reduced level, 11.8% who are in the process of a staggered return to work, and 19.6% who are now working full time but feel it's compromising their recovery. So of the 1,385 who were working previously, 1,289, that's 93% of long haulers, can no longer work as they were able to pre-COVID, after six or seven months. This is of huge importance to any government planning any kind of herd immunity strategy, and it's a factor completely overlooked by the Great Barrington Declaration. The impact of long COVID on not just the health service, but productivity as a whole and GDP is massive. Going back to a slightly more personal experiential level, what are the most challenging aspects of dealing with long COVID? Well, pretty much everything on this list is horrendous, but what's the worst? 
Rather than asking people to just choose one, which would risk everyone choosing the same one and not finding out what else was hard, I asked respondents to choose two. Not just physical aspects of the illness, but the knock-on consequences too, like the impact on mental health, finances, and relationships. And what were the results? Well, by far and away, the most commonly cited challenge of long COVID was fatigue. And for those watching who maybe haven't experienced what long COVID fatigue feels like, it's not like just being tired. Imagine being run over by a truck and then being chloroformed. When a wave hits you, no matter what you're doing, you're done. Such is the vast range of symptoms that I had to group them into physiological systems. In second place, neurological, which is the system including brain fog, dizziness, tingling, and vision problems. Sorry about the rubbish way Google is presenting this data, by the way. In third place, breathlessness and respiratory issues. Fourth place, heart issues, including high heart rate and palpitations. And also making this top five, the negative impact on mental health. This really doesn't surprise me, along with some recent hypotheses that connect anti-serotonin antibody persistence with long COVID. Basically, the overactive immune system diminishes your serotonin levels, with a consequential impact on your cognitive function, mood, and other regulatory processes. As an example of just how wide-ranging everyone's experience of long COVID is, every category on this list made at least 51 people's top two. Uh, 200 people, for example, choosing the impact on relationships and family as one of the most difficult things to deal with. Now, long COVID is infamous for its waves and relapses, which makes linear improvements very hard to judge. Also, some symptoms can get worse. But which ones? Well, almost tied at the top for symptoms which have got worse over time are fatigue and neurological issues. Heart issues in third place. All of these categories chosen more frequently than patients who said none of their symptoms had got worse. But not everything gets worse all the time. A high number of patients reported symptoms improving over time. In fact, all of these categories were reported as having improved more frequently than the most reported uh, worsening symptoms. That is to say, more people had got better than people had got worse. And only 130 or 8.3% had reported that none of their symptoms had improved. So let's get on to the subject we've all been waiting for, recovery. If you've been struggling with long COVID, you're almost certainly familiar with the snakes and ladders effect coined by Paul Garner in his piece in the BMJ, where any period of slight improvements is quickly followed by <laughs> some kind of relapse where you find yourself as bad as you were before or possibly even worse. What that means when judging recovery is that you have to look a little bit more macro than just day to day or even week to week. So let's look at how severe respondent symptoms were in the last month compared to the early months. Generally speaking, this is pretty encouraging. 68% of all respondents report their symptoms to be either slightly better or much better. 10% say they were about the same. 16% said they'd got worse. It's not always this clear cut though. This white section here represents everyone who didn't feel they fit into one of these categories. One comment kind of sums it up. Original symptoms are better, new ones are worse. And how about the broader question? Do people feel that over the course of their illness, their symptoms are generally improving? This isn't quite so positive. 22% seeing a large improvement, 35% seeing a slight improvement, and the next largest category, 357 people, or 22% saying, not sure, it's hard to tell. This is probably where I'd put myself, to be honest. And how many people claim to have completely recovered? Yeah, that's that small blue slice here. 25 people, or 1.6%. Now, this particular category is subject to some of that selection bias I mentioned earlier, but I was really hoping to see a higher number than this. It kind of means that we're more like here on the bell curve than here. As Prof Rob Copeland has previously said on this channel, I think we have to be prepared for long COVID to be a 12-month or more illness, not a six-month one. So let's dive in a little closer. For those who felt they'd started to improve, when did they feel the improvement started? This is quite a nice bell curve, and for most people, improvement started in month five. Ignore the double columns here, I think that's just the way that Google interprets the way people entered the data. The King's College London Symptom Tracking app represents that women are about twice as likely to experience long COVID as men. My data shows that correlation even more, 86% of respondents being female. This disparity most likely due to selection bias. And what about ages? Well, as we've seen before, it's a pretty even spread. Although, as mentioned at the start, we're probably not picking up too many of the young or old ends of the spectrum. 
What does it look like if we break down recovery by age and sex? Are we going to see lots more young people recovering than old ones? Well, here it is. And spoiler, no. The data is actually pretty even across the age groups. Looking at the graph here, where the blue bar is the average of the entire study and the darker shades illustrate ascending age groups, we can see that actually the younger age groups, under 24 and 25 to 34, report the condition worsening more frequently than the others. And amazingly, the highest proportion of total recoveries is seen in the 65 and over category. And if we simplify improvement into one category to simplify the data, with the exception of the under 24s who report it slightly less frequently, it's an amazingly even spread. Essentially, there is no correlation between age and speed of recovery from long COVID. How about the differences between the sexes? Well, there's not much in it, although women report getting worse at a slightly higher frequency, but also getting better at a slightly higher frequency than men. I suspect this is more due to the subjective nature of assessment and reporting rather than any biological difference. So it looks like once you've got it, age and sex are unlikely to be determining how quickly you recover. You won't have got very far into your long COVID journey before someone says to you, ah, you know what's going to make you better? Vitamin D, zinc, magnesium, eye of newt, toe of frog. Well, I can't comment on which supplements actually do work as that would require, you know, double blind tests and controls and proper trials. But what I can show you is which supplements were most frequently taken by people and reported as having a positive effect. Here's the list, make of it what you will. Pause if you want to go through it, I'm going to crack on. And how about medication? Well, this is more a reflection of how people have been suffering and what kind of symptoms they've been experiencing. Let's take a look at the most commonly prescribed and over-the-counter taken drugs. Antihistamines are at number one, but if you add the prednisolone and dex to the non-specific steroids, then that would top the list. I'm not surprised that these have been prescribed this frequently due to the inflammatory nature of the condition. Other major drug groups include those to manage stomach issues, mostly acid production, We've got peptid and gaviscon along with omaprazole and lanzoprazole. And then lots of headache management and non-steroidal inflammatories, aspirin, ibuprofen, paracetamol. Then some beta blockers to deal with heart issues and antidepressants made the list too. Separately, the word inhaler was also mentioned 196 times, suggesting lots of people had had issues with their breathing. The fact that 93% of long haulers who were previously in work are unable to go back to their previous level of activity shows you just how debilitating this condition is. But there are green shoots of recovery to be seen. Yes, these are subjective and yes, every improvement is usually associated with some kind of relapse, but reports of recovery here are common enough that I think we can start to have some hope. In the meantime, we have to keep managing the condition as best we can and perhaps try and reframe our expectations to try and protect our mental well-being. If we're able to accept the present as it is and not hang all our hopes on tomorrow being better, then perhaps we can get to the end of this rubbish journey <laughs> in one piece. Look after yourselves, until next time.